So I've learned that the brave are not without fear. It's how you respond to fear that makes the difference. But there is more to courage than managing fear. You have to make the right decisions in life. My skywalk will involve many crucial decisions. The diameter of the cable, whether to use a pole or not, should I use a safety harness, and if so, what kind? So I've come to MIT to explore the latest science on how to make better decisions. Hi, Tali. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Dr. Tali Chirot is director of the Effective Brain Lab at MIT and a world leader in the science of decision-making. Tali believes she knows why we make the decisions we do, and she has a test to illustrate the point. Um, we're going to do a test, and the way that it works is that on each trial, you're going to see um, a life event. It's a negative event. It could be all sorts of medical conditions or violent acts. And what you need to do is you need to think what is the likelihood is that that event will happen to you in your lifetime, okay? I'm writing the chance of bad stuff happening to me. Then the computer tells me what the actual likelihood is. 60% chance of me getting stopped. You have a go. Feeling, isn't it? How did you go? Okay, so um, now you're just gonna do a similar thing again. You're gonna see some of the events again and just put in whatever um, estimate you think now, okay? Regardless of what you did before. Abnormal heart rhythm. All right, I'm doing the same test again, but this time I know the statistical likelihood of bad things happening to me. Todd is doing a study that tests his optimism bias. The optimism bias is our tendency to overestimate the likelihood of good events happening to us and underestimate the likelihood of bad things happening to us. Um, okay, so I have your results here. Mm -hmm. And um, the results are pretty extreme. The main thing that we were testing is what do you do with information that I give you? Sometimes I gave you good news. So for example, you may have said, my likelihood of having um, cancer is 50%, and I said, hey, it's only 30% for you. So that's good news, right? Sometimes I gave you bad news. So you may have said, my likelihood of being robbed is 10%, and I said, hey, it's actually 60%, so that's bad news. And what we found was that when you got good news, you changed your beliefs a lot by 20 points on average. And when I gave you bad news, you change your beliefs on average by one point. By so is that limit. normal, the one point? Um, it's very extreme. <laughs> I don't, I mean, these are oh. one of the most extreme results I've ever seen. So when I get good news, I change my outlook to be 20% more positive. But I pretty much ignore any bad news. This only changes my thinking by 1%. Now I'm thinking back through all my life decisions, and when I made the decision to climb Mount Everest, I remember the stat at the time, which was one in six. So for every six to get to the top, one dies. And I can remember the time thinking, brilliant odds, because I'm going to be one of five. Yeah, so this is exactly it. When you hear those odds, for you, it actually means your likelihood is zero percent, because you're going to be one of the five, right? You're going to survive. So you're totally ignoring the bad information that people tell you. You're actually, you have a one in six chances of, of dying. 80% of us suffer from an optimism bias. This can have serious consequences when taking a gamble or even choosing unhealthy foods. 
Mostly, we underestimate the risk and overestimate the reward. Overall, it's a good bias because it motivates you to act, right? If you think, I'm more likely to get a promotion, I'm more likely to find love, you're going to go after those things, right? So it's a good thing. But there's also the negative aspects of the optimism bias, which is if we ignore bad news, then we might take risks that we shouldn't take. Clearly, I need to be aware of my optimism bias. But on the day of the Skywalk, only to make decisions under pressure. So today, I'm joining a team where making the right decisions can be the difference between life and death. Hi, hey, John. John. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. John McDonough is a team leader of training with Fire Rescue New South Wales. I need some help with my decision making and uh, no one makes harder decisions than firefighters. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, um, it's important that we make the right decision at the right time or there's some pretty serious consequences. Your station officer in charge of hose. Decision making in firefighting is absolutely critical. In real life, normally we make decisions only when we have sufficient information. Well, unfortunately on the fire ground, sometimes you just don't have sufficient information and you still have to act. Hey, guys. Uh, Todd, this is the rest of the guys uh, that'll be uh, working with us today. We've got to train my decision making, I'll be leading these guys into a burning building. So, um, these guys will be manning some of the hose lines while you're making some of the decisions as one of the officers. Sort of two competing. Before we go in, I need to understand the priorities behind their decisions. Sort of main objectives. One is to deal with the fire, put it out, find any victims that may still be inside the structure, and stop that fire from extending into any other parts of the structure. But the main rule is to make decisions slowly. Take a few seconds to think. You'll never make a worse decision by slowing down a bit. Yeah. OK. This is the location. It simulates a two-storey industrial building. My job today is to safely lead the team and make the right decisions so we retrieve four life-size dummies from the fire. Well, we're just about to go into the burning inferno. Both exciting and slightly anxious because I've had to learn in hours what takes uh, weeks, maybe years to commit to memory. This is decision making taken to the extreme. We're going in. We're going in. The smoke means I can't see. My only vision is through a thermal imaging camera. And the heat is rising. Let's head towards the fire. Okay. Okay, I'm a victim. Okay, my first decision. Remove the victim or put out the fire. What would you do? We need a rescue unit with a hose and help us with victim. Can you repeat your last message? We found a victim, so we can arrest you through in here now. Under pressure, I've made the wrong decision. We should put the fire out first, move the victim later. I need to slow down and think clearly. I'll get the hose. I send my team's third member, Jamie, to take the victim out. John and I push on to the fire. Ahead. The temperature is spiking over 100 degrees Celsius. And that's not our only problem. How much air you got left? My air is running out, and I'm very close to blacking out. Hey, there's another victim here. We find another victim, and then another. Now I have to choose between moving them or getting the team out before we run out of air. What do I do? I decide we move the two victims out. We're yet to find the last victim. So where haven't we searched yet? I believe there's a mezzanine level. John warns me that the temperature up there is over 65 degrees. Hot enough to melt my face mask. But now my optimism bias is kicking in, clouding my judgment. Come back down, it's too hot, let's go. Come down. 
Are you sure we don't want to leave someone up here? Okay, what do you want to do, boss? I want to rescue the last victim, but it's too hot and we've nearly run out of air. This is tough. Do I get the victim or my team out? We have to make a decision. Okay, we're getting out. We're on our way out, over. Wow, that was intense. Uh, there was so much going on. I just didn't want to leave the fourth victim. Once John got the fire under control, then my mind just went, get the victims out, fire done. And then I went upstairs and the stairs were incredibly hot. I could feel it burning through my knee pads. You've got to act, make good decisions because that window of opportunity, it's running out. You've exactly felt that feeling that we all feel at fires. I think I got two of the three key decisions right. I wonder what John thinks. He stuck to his guns. He knew that his eyes were the thermal image camera and he just kept on looking through it. He just kept on target with it. And he knew that he had to get the fire out or things weren't gonna get better. And he never really lost his cool at all. He was always very calm and collected. That taught me a lot about decision-making. I was able to control my fear. I could calm myself down and stay in the moment. But my desperate desire to find the fourth person could have cost me my life and potentially John's. So a big learning for me is stick to protocol, watch out for optimism bias.